Hi there, it's me, Meg, and we're back with episode two of True Anomalies, Tales from the History of Science. This time, our scurvy knaves. When's the last time you worried about getting scurvy? Probably not too recently, but it wasn't that long ago that it was a major health problem in the developed world, responsible for thousands of deaths worldwide, and what exactly caused it and how to avoid it were serious questions without answers. Scurvy's not very common anymore. That's because we know that it's caused by a deficiency of ascorbic acid, vitamin C, which is found in all kinds of tasty foods that are normally readily available. But what if you didn't know that, and you decided to eat nothing but, say, popcorn, because you love popcorn so much, and you hate vegetables? In a few weeks, you'd start noticing some typical symptoms of scurvy. Lethargy, easy bruising, gum disease, wounds that don't heal, loose teeth, yeah, pretty horrible, don't ever do that. These symptoms are all related to the failure to make and repair strong, healthy, connective tissue. You know, the stuff that holds us all together. And the main component of that is collagen. Type 1 collagen by itself is the most abundant protein found in mammals. And vitamin C is essential to its formation. So when we don't get enough of it from our diets, we're in really big trouble. You probably don't need to worry about it, but people haven't always been in a position to choose a balanced diet. Take one classic scurvy stereotype. Pirates. That's a go-to scurvy reference because scurvy was a huge problem for pirates and everyone else that went on long sea voyages without frequent access to fresh food. In fact, references to the disease date back to antiquity, and it affected many legendary expeditions, including those of Vasco da Gama and Magellan in the early modern period, Captain James Cook two centuries later, and the South Polar explorers Scott and Shackleton in the early 20th century. The funny thing is, there were times when it seemed like the secret to preventing scurvy had been figured out, and other times when it seems to have been forgotten again. Explorer Jacques Cartier followed the natives' advice in 1536 and made cedar needle tea for his men, and the East India Company's Surgeon General John Woodall recommended fresh food and particularly citrus fruit in his 1610 handbook, The Surgeon's Mate. James Lind proved that scurvy could actually be treated and cured with lemons and limes in what's sometimes called the first clinical trial in 1747. And there are lots of other examples where it sounds like ship captains or quartermasters or doctors knew that something was special about citrus and fresh food in general. But there are just as many documented disasters. So what happened? Why was scurvy so difficult to pin down? For one thing, consider what you would do in this situation. You're planning a long voyage, and you know that scurvy will be a problem, so you bring along enough lime juice or sauerkraut to give to all of your sailors for the entire trip. And it doesn't work. Your men still get scurvy. Were the doctors just wrong? How would you know what to trust? Now we know that the methods used to preserve fresh food on ships often ended up destroying its vitamin C content in the process, so the very thing that was supposed to keep everyone safe instead was rendered worse than useless. It may also help to put things in perspective to note that all of the people we've mentioned so far were living and working before the word vitamin was a word. In fact, the whole idea that we might need certain good compounds, as opposed to avoiding other bad ones, wasn't generally accepted until the early 20th century. Now try to imagine how you would go about diagnosing scurvy. Oh, and one other thing. All scurvy researchers had to go on were records of human encounters with the disease, because there hadn't been any documented cases of animal scurvy. So there was no way to run an experiment to see exactly what factors caused or cured the disease. That is, until two Norwegian researchers discovered the perfect animal model, the guinea pig. Axel Hulse and Theodor Froelich, both professors at the University of Oslo, shared an interest in nutritional maladies. And while studying a disease known as ship beriberi, they decided to try a mammalian test subject, instead of the pigeons they'd been using already. When they switched to guinea pigs, they noticed right away that the rodents developed symptoms, not of ship beriberi, but of scurvy. And with a little more work, they identified foods that must contain some very specific antiscorbutic substance that could cure it. All right. Time out. To talk about the history of scurvy, we have to talk about animal research. That can be tough since lots of people have strong opinions about the ethics and the benefits of using animal subjects to address scientific questions. But you don't have to have an agenda to point out that animal research has played a large role in science throughout its history. Episodes like this one help us to understand all sorts of things, from how advances in science are made to how science interacts with society. So with that in mind, what's so interesting about this story anyway? 
Well, when Hulse and Froelich chose the guinea pig as their animal model for scurvy, they didn't know it, but they had stumbled upon something big. At a glance, guinea pigs and humans may not seem very similar, but we share a very specific and very rare attribute with our furry friends. Our bodies don't produce vitamin C, so we need to obtain it from our diet. Almost every other known animal species makes ascorbic acid for itself and is thus never at risk of getting scurvy. That's why studies of pigeons and dogs never turned up the disease, but guinea pigs? Bingo. But was it just dumb luck that they picked the perfect subject? Guinea pigs were brought to Europe from South America sometime in the 1500s. It's said that Queen Elizabeth I even kept one as a pet. There are a few mentions of them as lab animals dating back to the 17th century, but they're pretty infrequent, until the advent of germ theory in the mid to late 1800s. Louis Pasteur and Emile Roux used guinea pigs extensively in their experiments on infectious disease, and Robert Koch preferred them in his tuberculosis research because they're docile and easy to work with. In this particular enclave of science, the guinea pig was a popular subject. So these critters weren't completely new to the lab, but they weren't exactly widespread either. As it happens, Holst was working in Koch's lab when he announced the discovery of tuberculin, so he would have been familiar with guinea pigs in the lab. When he returned to Norway, he brought with him two things, his experience working in Koch's lab and an interest in nutritional diseases. Two things that, by coincidence, gave him a leg up in scurvy research. This time, the stars seem to have been pretty well aligned. Does that mean that sometimes scientists just get lucky? While chance, or serendipity in science, can be a tricky idea. For one thing, hindsight is 2020, as they say, so it's often only in retrospect that a choice seems fortuitous, like in this case with the guinea pigs. The key word here being choice. Decisions in science are made all the time, on a daily basis even, by all levels of researchers in all stages of an experiment or model. Taking what you know and deciding what to do next with it requires making choices. Some of them will lead you to new insights, while others may take you on the scenic route, and you never know which will be considered lucky until after the fact. But does it really matter how it happens if we get to the same answer in the end? Who knows? We only get to choose once. We don't get any do-overs. Whenever there's a choice to be made, luck comes into play in science just like in anything else. So, are you feeling lucky today?